You did, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here we are, down the home stretch. Ready for this? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is the session that you've all been waiting for. <laughs> uh, where we're going to have the review for the final examination, and I'm going to give you a series of questions. And as I go through these questions, one by one by one, we'll spend several minutes on each one of the questions because I want to make sure that everybody understands, first of all, what the question is asking. And then secondly, what kinds of things am I looking for in a satisfactory answer to each one of the questions? And as we go along, if you've got questions here, those of you who are here with me in the classroom, please bring them up. Because remember, you're asking those questions not only for yourself, but you're also asking them on behalf of students who are taking this course at a distance and don't have the opportunity to ask me directly. OK, so let's go to number one. And as you're going to see, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of the course. And we're going to go step by step by step through the entire course. So first, discuss some specific strategies Blake uses in his Critique of Society in London, and at least two other poems. OK, so in this essay, if you got this question on the exam, you would talk about London and how that functions as a critique of Blake's society. That would be late 18th century, early 19th century London. And then you would bring in at least two other poems which involved a critique of his society. And we spent a lot of time on those, didn't we? We've got the little black boy. We've got the chimney sweep poems. We've got the Holy Thursday poems. We've got the, uh, the, the Garden of Love uh, as well as London. OK. Any questions about that? Oh, and by the way, since I didn't actually say this at the beginning of this review, though I did say it earlier on in the course, let me once again say that the final examination will be taken from this list of study questions that we're going through now. Without any changes, I'm not going to take a, a question and reword it or change it in any way. What you will get on the final examination will be questions drawn from this list. OK? All right. And by the way, I prefer that you bring blue books. Everybody knows what a blue book is, right? A blue book, an examination, little examination book. They're a lot easier to handle and to keep track of than just a lot of loose papers. So. Those are available at the bookstore. Uh, you know, I don't know what they, it's like 25 cents or something like that. And any place that uh, is a college bookstore or sells college books and supplies around the city will, uh, will have blue books. You know, so it doesn't have to be just our university bookstore. Like, you know, there are lots of places uh, that Houston Community College has campuses. And you could, you know, if that's close to your home, you know, you can pick one up there. Yeah, question. Yeah, I have a couple questions. First, what length of response are you going to be looking for for answering these questions? And secondly, how many of these questions will be on the final? Uh, <clears throat> uh, you'll probably have four questions on the final. And um, the it, it really. Your first question is a good question. How long should it be? Um, most people write, oh, two pages at least in response to each question. Maybe a little bit more, depending on how fast you write. I mean, you know, to a certain extent, uh, that depends on your manual dexterity, I suppose. <laughs> 
um, I had a, a good friend when I was in graduate school, and he and I would uh, take a lot of classes together, and therefore we ended up sitting for a lot of exams together. And, uh, you know, I would write furiously for two hours and produce maybe about eight pages handwritten. Uh, and he would write furiously for two hours and produce about 12 pages. Uh, we all, we both got the same grades, by the way, so I guess, you know, we both did satisfactory jobs, but somehow or another, he could make his, his hand go faster than mine. Um, so, you know, it, it just depends on you to a certain extent. Yeah. Are you going to kick us out if we don't finish on time, or is there a time limit? No, the... Uh, the time limit is three hours. Most people do not take three hours. In fact, most people take about an hour and a half to do this exam. But uh, you have a full three hours if you want to use the full three hours. So. Do you think we might need to bring two blue books if we write? Well, you can always large. use it in another class if you, uh, you know, if if you need to bring two, bring two, or if you even think you might need to bring two bring to. They're cheap, you know, and you can use it in other classes, I say. Yeah, question? Don't forget to press your button. Are we, we're answering two questions on the exam? No, you'll probably have four questions. Two and answer? Or or just, you'll you'll just have four to answer. Yeah. Okay. Okay, any other questions just about the, yeah, okay. All right. Uh, so the first one then is on Blake. Second question, you're not going to be surprised by this. Analyze in detail at least one passage in Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey explaining how he believes that he can know some transcendent or transcendental reality. Now, what does that mean? Remember, we talked a good deal about that. Words such as transcendent and transcendental mean beyond our ordinary experience in the world. And there are people who have believed and who continue to believe that it is possible to have an experience even here on earth of some transcendent or transcendental reality such as Wordsworth describes in Tintern Abbey where remember he claims that the experience he had out there five years ago was an experience of the great spirit that rolls through all things that somehow or another he established spiritual communion with. Does that make sense? I mean, we talked a great deal about it at the time. Okay? And so take at least one passage out of Tintern Abbey and explain how Wordsworth believes this. Okay, this is not about whether or not you believe this. This is about how Wordsworth thought and what Wordsworth believed. How he believes that he can know transcendental reality. He can make some kind of spiritual breakthrough to a world beyond which somehow is already there in the world because this spiritual reality is infused, deeply infused into all things. It's just that most people don't understand that. And we talked about how a certain form of rationalism in the 18th and 19th, and of course, modern contemporary times, 
the 18th and 19th centuries, but on down to the present time, a certain kind of rationalism or a certain kind of empiricism or a certain kind of positivism deliberately seeks to cut us off from that regarding the only valid forms of knowledge, those that we can experience either directly or indirectly with our senses, right? Empirical facts. Now, what Wordsworth is doing is claiming, as well as other romantics often claimed, what Wordsworth is claiming is that there is another and spiritual reality, and that is knowable. But it is knowable only through an examination of our subjective experience when we have our encounters in nature with that reality. In other words, not only is objective reality there, but subjective reality is also a valid form of knowledge. Okay, does that make sense now? That uh, we talk a lot in the sciences and the social sciences about objective knowledge. What Wordsworth and people like Wordsworth are claiming is that subjective knowledge is also valid knowledge. It's just a different kind of knowledge. And it is knowledge of spiritual reality, which comes to us through examining our subjective responses in our encounters with nature. So you'll deal with that in Tintern Abbey and then take at least one passage from the prelude. And there are some fairly obvious cases that you could choose from, and we went over that in some detail here in class. And some of those passages, by the way, in some detail. Okay. And don't hesitate to stop me if you want to uh, ask a question about this. Three, explain Coleridge's distinctions regarding imagination and fancy. And then apply these distinctions in detail to at least one romantic poem. Could be a poem by Coleridge, but it could be a poem by another romantic poet. But remember in the Biographia Literaria, and we went through passages in great detail, Coleridge distinguishes between what he calls fancy and what he calls imagination. And he says that one kind of poetry is produced by fancy and another kind of poetry is produced by imagination. So what you would do is, first of all, define what Coleridge means by these two terms. And then look at a romantic poem. It could be, as I said, one of Coleridge's, or it could be one by somebody else. And explain how you think that poem fits into Coleridge's distinction. Okay? And remember that Coleridge not only distinguishes between fancy and imagination, but between primary and secondary imagination. Primary imagination being that faculty through which we have the experience of spiritual reality. But while we're in the middle of that experience, we can't write a poem. You can't have the experience or write a poem about the experience at the same time. So secondary imagination is secondary in the sense that it is what you do later on when you reflect on the experience perhaps even relive 
in imagination the experience and write a poem about it. Okay? Fourth, explain the moral and spiritual lesson the ancient mariner learns in Coleridge's rhyme, that is, rhyme of the ancient mariner. And then explain why you do or do not agree with him that his presentation of that lesson at the end is a defect in the poem. Now, remember the end of the poem? You know, you get to, well, well, let's go back to the beginning. You know, you have the ancient mariner who stops the wedding guest. And in this hypnotic gaze is able to freeze the wedding guest in place so that the ancient mariner can tell his tale. And he tells a tale of how he was on a ship And at one point, he killed an albatross, which was a sign to sailors of good luck. Not only just a sign of good luck, but a bringer of good luck. And after killing the albatross, the ship is becalmed, apparently in the South Pacific, and a ship which is becalmed, we're talking about a sailing ship now, becalmed meaning that there's no wind, so it can't move. I mean, may be tossed a little bit here and there by the currents, but it doesn't really move. And so people can die out there in this motionless or virtually motionless ship in the middle of the ocean because they can't get to land, they can't get fresh water, they can't get food, so they simply die. And there were accounts in Coleridge's time of ghost ships, of a ship coming upon a ghost ship. They would board the ship and nobody would be alive. Coleridge read some of those accounts, he was very moved by them. And that's the sort of thing that he used in constructing his poem. Well, what the ancient mariner eventually learns is that all beings are, in some sense, holy. All beings are holy. Even these squirmy, serpent-like uh, beings who are swimming around the ship. And when he blesses them in his recognition of their holiness, Suddenly, the albatross falls from his neck. The wind begins to blow, and it takes the ship, and therefore him, back home. The poem then ends after he makes his confession, apparently, to a, uh, a holy man, a, a priest of some kind, a hermit uh, priest. We then have tacked on at the end several stanzas in which the speaker in the poem really gives us a kind of lay sermon about what love is or ought to be. Okay? Now, Coleridge at one point was at a dinner party. And one of the people at the dinner party said to, uh, to Coleridge, well, I really wish that your poem had had more of a moral, to which Coleridge claims that he replied. But I think the problem with my poem is that it has too much of a moral. And what he means by that is that he's too heavy-handed at the end, that the point had been made by the poem itself rather than coming out at the end and hitting us over the head with the point. Okay? So 
In answering this question, what you would be doing, once again, is first of all, explaining the moral and spiritual lesson the ancient mariner learns. And of course, you're making specific reference to the poem, right? I mean, need I pause and say something about that? That when you are answering one of these questions, be sure to make specific references to the work. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to quote it. I mean, you can quote a line if you want to, but you don't have to spend your time, you know, just quoting, transcribing something out of your textbook. Okay? And yes, you can bring your textbooks to the class. And yes, somebody always asks me, can I bring a dictionary? Yes, you can bring a dictionary if you want to bring a dictionary. I ask you, however, not to bring any notes or additional materials. But you can bring your textbooks, and you can bring a dictionary, and you will bring one or more blue books. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> so you'll make specific references to Coleridge's poem, and then explain whether you agree or don't agree with him that his presentation of that lesson in the end is a defect in the poem. You don't have to agree with, with Coleridge. Okay? But if you do agree with him, I want to know why. And notice that what he seems to be saying is something not unlike what Keats was talking about with negative capability, but we'll get to that more. Yeah? Um, he has a poem called The Ancient Mariner, but what you're talking about is the one called The Rhyme, is that correct? The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. The rhyme, yeah. The, yeah, the, it's called The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And that's the one that we looked at in detail here in class. Okay? Okay, number five. According to Coleridge in his Biographia Literaria, in other words, his literary biography, or as we would say, autobiography, he and Wordsworth, remember they were very close friends from a pretty early age on, that he and Wordsworth sought to write different kinds of poems for their collaborative work, Lyrical Ballads. Okay, they used to take long walks together, talk about poetry, talk about one another's poetry. They read one another's poetry. They discussed it. They decided to write a book together, which is a collection of poems called Lyrical Ballads, originally published in 1798, and then republished in its second edition in 1800 with a preface by Wordsworth, his famous preface, in which he talks about how poetry is created out of powerful emotion recollected in tranquility. Coleridge, in his Biographia Literaria, says that he and Wordsworth were trying to write different kinds of poems in lyrical ballads. So, with specific references to a poem by each of the two poets, explain how each poet carried out his task, which means that you've got to figure out, well, what was the task? What was the task that Wordsworth set himself, and what was the task that Coleridge set himself? Now, who knows whether it was quite as neat as all of that, but that at least is what Coleridge says about what they were doing in the book. Okay? So you go through and you look to see what was... Coleridge supposed to do? He was supposed to produce poems about 
persons or occurrences that were either supernatural or at least something that would be extraordinary and well beyond what we would expect to find in the natural world. But to treat such persons and or occurrences in such a way as to make them believable, to make them believable, as if they were natural occurrences. And Wordsworth's task, according to Coleridge, was the opposite. To take the everyday occurrences of everyday life, all of those things that we just take for granted is perfectly natural in life. And to show how truly extraordinary they are. How truly extraordinary they are. That you should be able to look into your own backyard and see what is truly extraordinary there. At least, you know, according to Wordsworth. You don't have to travel to Tintern Abbey. You know, you can do it right here. <coughs> okay, six. Define the Byronic hero. We spent a good deal of time on that. What is the Byronic hero? And then explain what appears to be Byron's attitude toward Napoleon as a representative of that concept in Child Herald. In other words, you do two things. First of all, you define what it means to be a Byronic hero, a so-called Byronic hero. And we spent a fair amount of time talking about that, didn't we? The Byronic hero is a rebel. The Byronic hero is someone who stands apart. The Byronic hero is someone who may even stand above the rest of human beings. And we talked about some of the characteristics of that. And then we looked at various passages in Byron's long poem, Child Herald. And in particular, we looked at the passage, fairly lengthy passage, dealing with Napoleon. And we looked at how complex Byron's attitude toward Napoleon appeared to be. Napoleon treated here as Byronic hero. Okay. And again, of course, you would make some very specific reference to the text. Seven. Explain at least one sense in which Keats uses the term negative capability and then apply it to one poem by Shelley and one by Keats. Now, in his letter to his brothers, you will recall, Keats talks about what he calls negative capability as the mark of real genius in writing. And he says that this is the quality that Shakespeare had above all other qualities, the quality of negative capability. The ability not to jump to conclusions about complicated matters, the ability not to simplify and certainly not to oversimplify complicated people or complicated problems or complicated situations. The ability to hold oneself back, that's the sense in which it's negative, from the quite natural impulse to simplify a very complex person or occurrence 
or problem or question. We all, or at least most of us, have that yearning to be able to simplify things and to make them clear. And what Keats says is that Shakespeare had the ability to hold himself back from following that otherwise quite natural impulse. Now, notice how that could be applied to Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. If you agree with Coleridge that he went too far in beating us over the head with his little sermonette on love, then that would be a lapse away from negative capability according to Keats's conception. So now, take a poem by Shelley. We did some poems by Shelley. And take a poem by Keats and say whether or not you think that each of these poems either does embody or does not embody negative capability. Okay? I think I have one question. Yeah, sure. Negative capability, is that anywhere along the lines of um, being incompetent? No. No. Well, you know, it's, it's his phrase and we're stuck with it. In a, in a sense, we're stuck with it. I mean, we can come up with other language if we want to. But uh, as a matter of fact, he's the one who coined the term. Now, maybe you and I, uh, in, in our time, would want to come up with a different term in order to be more clear, not only for ourselves, but also for our contemporaries. But what he's talking about is the tendency when we are dealing with a very complicated and maybe ambiguous and maybe murky situation in which there are, you know, it's, it's difficult to think your way through to what is correct or what's incorrect or what's right or what's wrong. There is a natural impulse that many people have to want to simplify things in order to achieve clarity. For example, to make things right or wrong, right? Well, maybe life isn't quite like that. Maybe you can't always be that clear, okay? So what if you have the ability to hold yourself back from the impulse towards simplifying in order to clarify? Yeah. So, you're saying that in, in this term, in the term of ne negative capability as applies to Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, that because he so simplifies and gives a moral himself at the end of the poem, that, that he's therefore not leaving it open to interpretation, and, and that would be, that would be simplified? Right, okay. right, 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 right. That would be a, certainly a way that you could write that essay. Now, on the other hand, you know, you could take the opposite point of view and say, well, I don't really think that uh, this is a defect in the poem. Okay? I mean, you could take one of, uh, one of Keats's odes and, uh, and look at that and see whether or not you think that Keats followed his own dictum. Okay, have I answered your question? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, keep at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, keep at it. Okay, eight. Analyze specific passages in Tennyson's and Arnold's poetry to show how each understood and responded to the Victorian crisis of faith. <laughs> 
And we were talking about that in the first part of today's class, weren't we? Just by way of review a little bit. Uh, look at Tennyson's In Memoriam. We spent a lot of time on Tennyson's In Memoriam, didn't we? And as I said earlier, the very fact that Tennyson had to spend so much time wrestling with the question of faith necessarily implies that it was a serious crisis for him. Not only was the death of his friend a serious crisis for him, but he desperately wanted to believe in what traditional Christianity had taught him about the immortality of the soul so that he could believe that, yes, his friend Hallam does indeed still live. Not here, but does still live in another place. Okay? And that wasn't easy for him to work out because of the kinds of things that had been happening in the 19th century that were calling traditional forms of belief into question. Now, once again, that doesn't mean that everybody abandoned religious belief by any means. There were millions and millions and millions of people who were and still are traditional religious believers of one form or another. But there were also people who began to raise very disturbing questions. Disturbing enough that Tennyson feels impelled to spend a lot of time and a lot of energy in writing this poem to try to work his way through it. And then we've got Arnold. We were talking about Arnold in the first half of uh, today's class in stanzas from the Grand Chartreuse. Wanting to be able to share the kind of faith that he believes these monks in the monastery are acting out in their everyday lives in the monastery, but realizing that he can't do it. He's no longer part of that world. And in Dover Beach, for example, realizing that the sea of faith, at least for, for him, the sea of faith has receded, has gone out. And so as he looks to his bride, he says, you know, what have we got? We can hang on to one another. You know, in this world that is, as it were, ignorant armies clashing by night. And of course, you know what the metaphor is. One of the reasons why armies do not usually battle one another at night, I mean, sometimes they do, but why they usually don't, and certainly in traditional warfare did not, because that was hand-to-hand -hand warfare, and it was difficult to tell if it was dark who was who, right? I mean, you could be killing your own buddies, or your buddies could be killing you and not even know it. Because in traditional warfare, unlike modern warfare, it was all hand-to-hand, -hand, or virtually all, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Okay? So, is that what the world is like? Unless you have a loved one to cling to? and find some value in that relationship, at least? Well, um, okay. Nine. In Hard Times, how does Dickens use the characters of Gradgrind, Bounderby, and Blackpool in his critique of 19th century society? Okay. Notice that a number of the people we're dealing with are performing critiques of their society, aren't they? We talked about that with Blake. 
We talked about that by implication with the Romantics because people like Wordsworth and Coleridge in particular are claiming that there is a purer reality than that which is being realized in the industrialism and urbanization of the modern world and some of its narrowly positivistic attitudes. So here too, Dickens is very much a social critic. When we were talking about Dickens, I even said, you know, uh, during the holiday season, when you no doubt will have uh, at least one and probably more than one production on television of uh, A Christmas Carol, right? Look at it with a new set of eyes. That is social criticism. Okay? Well, let's take hard times. How does Dickens use the characters of Grad Grind, Bounderby, and Blackpool in his critique of 19th century society? We spent a good deal of time talking about that in that novel. Okay. Yeah, question. Can we bring a copy of the novel? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I say you can bring the texts, that's plural. That's plural. Yes, that's plural. Uh, yes, you can bring not only your uh, Norton anthology, but you can also bring a copy of Hard Times, and you can bring a copy of Mrs. Dalloway. Okay. And in fact, I would encourage you to bring copies of those. And unless you have, you know, one of those amazing photographic memories that, uh, you know, now has inscribed in your brain, you know, every last word of these works. Okay. Still on hard times, number 10. What are the functions of the principal women characters in Hard Times? Last question was about the men characters. What about the principal women characters in Hard Times? Sissy, Louisa, Rachel, and Mrs. Sparsett. What are the functions of those characters? What are they doing there? Why has Dickens put them in his novel and developed them and their relationships the way he does? What is he trying to accomplish by the way he develops those characters? Okay. Both in the narrative development of the plot and in some ways is part of his social criticism. Now notice that some of these characters are good characters, aren't they? Men and women. And some of them are not. And some of them are somewhat mixed. Eleven. What is the function of the descriptions of Coke Town in hard times? Remember the descriptions of Coke Town? We have some very elaborate physical descriptions. And then off and on in the narrative, we have descriptions of this place, descriptions of that place, and so forth. But early on in the novel, we have a quite lengthy physical description. And in the words of the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, all is bleared, smeared with toil. This is the Industrial Revolution in terms of its dark side. 
It may well be that the Industrial Revolution produced many wonderful things. But one of the things that was already clear to many people in the 19th century was that there was a dark side as well. Okay, 12. Explain in detail how Ruskin uses ancient, medieval, and Victorian architectural forms in his cultural criticism in Stones of Venice. Now remember what his cultural criticism is. He, like Dickens and others, but he, like Dickens, is going to say there is something wrong with the way we treat people in the modern world. What we're doing, among other things, is we are destroying their individuality. And we are forcing them into different kinds of labor in which they're rewarded simply for conformity. Simply for conformity. And so he takes the daring move, daring in his time, of going back to the Middle Ages, which for centuries then had been looked down on as a period of cultural decline. And he says, oh no, that was not a period of cultural decline. That was actually the finest moment for our culture. Because in the Middle Ages, if you really look at the Gothic cathedrals produced, what you will see is that individuals were given the freedom to develop and to express their individuality in a way that individuals could not in the ancient world or in the modern world. Okay, and that's his basic argument. And by the way, his celebration of medieval architecture, as I mentioned at the time, uh, issued in this whole revival of interest in the Gothic, in Gothic architecture, in Gothic uh, or medieval paintings and, and ornamentation and so forth. And as I said when we were looking at Ruskin, there are churches, not just Catholic churches, but Protestant churches all over, not only England, but North America, that are designed in certain ways to look like Gothic churches from the Middle Ages. And that is largely a result of the influence of John Ruskin. And we find that among pre-Raphaelite painters as well. And the glass work they did, William Morris's books, you know, and the, uh, the artwork in his books, and so on and so on and so on. What we now call medievalism, medievalism. That is to say, the, the cult of things medieval, especially for aesthetic purposes in the 19th and 20th centuries. Tolkien. You know, a lot of people have read the, uh, the Tolkien books, The Lord of the Rings, or at least have seen the movies if you haven't read the books. Uh, that's medievalism too, isn't it? I mean, Tolkien is a 20th century professor. He's an English professor. And, uh, you know, he wrote those novels, and uh, he was a professor of medieval literature and languages. And he drew on his version of medievalism in those novels. And that was very, very popular kind of thing to do in the latter part of the 19th century and at least the first half of the 20th century, though in some respects maybe still. Video games, which are still based on medieval figures and medieval motifs. Okay. All right. So, 
What does he say about architectural forms in the ancient world, the Middle Ages, and the modern world? And how does he use architecture as a key to his cultural criticism? See, the logic of that position is that what we produce says something about us, right? What we produce as a culture says something important about us. Now, one of the most obvious and public things that we produce is our architecture. If we look at the ancient world, we believe that we can tell something about the culture of antiquity by looking at their architecture. If we look at the Middle Ages, we believe that we can tell something about the culture of medieval men and women by studying their architecture and so also in the modern age. Okay. Thirteen. Compare Browning's use or uses of speakers in at least two of his poems. In at least two of his poems. And we look carefully at several of his poems here. So notice, um, you know, you could take one of those poems and and remember that they are, well, they aren't all, but but notice that one of the things that he is particularly noted for is the dramatic monologue. In which you've got one speaker as in my last duchess. But we can infer from what he says the responses of the other person to whom he is speaking. So what's Browning doing there? In Philippa Lippi, much of the poem is spoken by Philippa Lippi, but not all of it. There are actually some parts that are not. And then, of course, we've got um, Caliban upon Cenobos. You know, another very, very interesting poem in its own right. So take two of his poems and talk about how he uses the speakers in the poems. Okay. Fourteen, compare some of the attitudes of the esthetes of the 1890s with those of at least two World War I poets. Okay, remember the esthetes and aestheticism? That's art for art's sake. I mean, to put it in a in a easy to remember phrase art for art's sake remember oscar wilde in his preface to dorian gray his novel dorian gray the picture of dorian gray wilde wrote a preface in which he is arguing that art should not be subject to our usual social and moral norms, that art is something else, something which exists in a realm unto itself, and therefore should only be judged by the norms of art and not by the norms of morality or conformity to societal uh, values or politics, or religion, or anything else except the norms of art. The only question about a novel is whether or not it is a good novel. Is it a well-written novel? Is it a good piece of art? <clears throat> 
Okay? Now, you don't have to agree with that, by the way. I'm just saying that that was the kind of argument that people were making. And that's a particularly associated in the English-speaking world with the so-called esthetes of the 1890s. The movement of aestheticism or art for art's sake. Okay? So what that means then is going back to something like uh, Keats's negative capability, is that artists should not be trying to make or to score points with us on religious grounds, moral grounds, political grounds, and so on and so on and so on. I mean, think about the political, for example. Should poetry be engaged in making political points? Or should poetry avoid politics? And should poetry be judged whether it's good poetry or not, and not whether it's good politics or not? Now, it becomes very complicated when you get to something like Yeats's Easter 1916, right? I mean, most literary critics would agree that this is one of the masterpieces of modern poetry. And yet, notice that that poem is profoundly political, isn't it? Because it deals quite directly, and for the most part, quite sympathetically, with one of the great political events of its time, which aroused enormous political controversy. Or to take another Irish poet, whom we've just been recently studying, look at Seamus Haney's poem, Casualty. You know, that's about a very, very serious political problem of our time. Okay? Now, I happen to think, now whether you agree with me or not, but I happen to think that this is a very, very fine poem. But notice that I'm not making a judgment about the poem at that stage as to whether you know, he takes the right side or the wrong side politically. That's the sort of thing that Wilde is talking about. Okay? What if somebody were to come along and dismiss the poem on political grounds? Wilde would say, no, 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 no. You can only judge it on aesthetic grounds. Okay? But then look at the World War I poets who really come in the next generation. The people who are in their heyday in the 1890s are going to be followed, you know, 20 years or so, 25 years, etc., later by this new, younger generation of people who actually go off to war in World War I. The great horror of World War I. And what do they do? Okay. What kind of poetry do they feel impelled, even compelled, to write? It certainly doesn't fit easily into the norms of the aesthetes of the 1890s. Okay? I mean, think of the, the criticism of traditional attitudes towards the military, you know, and the generals, and all of the idealism about the patriotic glory of going off to fight, even to die in battle. And our World War I poets, you know, again and again and again coming back and saying, this is madness. This is absolute madness. Okay? Now, how would that kind of poetry sit with the sorts of attitudes towards poetry or views of poetry 
that were developed by the Art for Art's Sake group in the 1890s. This is a question just to think about. A number of these are not just questions you can look up the answer to in the book. These are thought questions. In other words, questions in which I'm asking you to think through a problem. Okay, in which there's not a single answer, but what I'm interested in is how you work your way through the problem. And by the way, you don't always have to agree with me, just because I will give you my views of these things uh, as we're going along. You don't have to agree with me. You're not going to be graded on uh, whether you agree with me or, or disagree with me. Okay, but rather on how you make the case for the views that you present. Okay. Fifteen. Explain in detail how Pater and Hopkins anticipate many of the features of modernism. Now, Pater certainly is talking about. Uh, you know, many of the values of modernism. So that when he talks about how uh, art should produce in us a kind of intensity of feeling, just to take one example from quite a number of examples that we could take from Pater, notice that he is anticipating our emphasis on aesthetic experience and aesthetic response rather than how a work is structured or put together as such. Okay. And Hopkins, as we saw in his poetry, is involved in some amazing experiments with language and with poetic form. It would be difficult. My first impulse is that it would be impossible. But who knows whether it's impossible. Uh, it certainly would be extremely difficult and it would be extremely unlikely that you could find anybody writing poetry the way Hopkins wrote poetry before Hopkins. But after Hopkins was rediscovered, after World War I, and especially in the 1920s and thereafter, you see the influence of Hopkins in a number of poets. Now, we were looking at Ted Hughes earlier. And you can see, I even mentioned at one point, doesn't that sound like, uh, like, like Hopkins? Okay, experiments with language and experimentalism as being one of the things that goes on in modernism. 16. In Conrad's Heart of Darkness, how does Kurtz figure in the critique of Western civilization? Now, we talked a good deal about how the work, in one sense, is a representation of Conrad's views of Africa. But in another sense, it's really a critique of Western civilization, isn't it? He refers to the Western city, apparently Brussels, where the company by which he is employed is centered as a whited sepulcher with all of the resonance that that phrase has from the Bible. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. White and gleaming on the outside but rotting and filled with dead men's bones on the inside. And that's what the civilization 
is like, at least from a certain point of view. So, how does the Kurtz figure, excuse me, how does Kurtz figure in the critique of Western civilization? It's a very interesting and very important question. 17. Compare Darwin's and Conrad's or Barlow's, because sometimes it's not always clear whether Marlowe speaks for Conrad or not. Just like the question of whether or not Gulliver speaks for Swift. Compare Darwin's and Conrad's or Marlowe's ambivalence toward recognizing their kinship with non-Western peoples. Now remember Darwin in The Descent of Man? A selection of which we have in our text comes upon these people, indigenous people, while in Tierra del Fuego, down at the tip of South America, the southernmost tip of South America. And he says he was just horrified to realize that however distantly he was related to these people. Now, of course there is all of the racism and racialism involved in that. And all of that 19th century bias, which was founded on a certain evolutionary scheme, the belief that human beings were evolving not only physically, but also in terms of their civilizations. And that the human family was moving toward higher and higher and higher forms of civilization, but there were still lower forms of civilization around. And of course, because it was white Europeans, they were writing the books about this kind of cultural evolution. Guess who came out on top? White Europeans were represented as the most highly evolved form of civilization. So, uh, that's one of the things that, that come, is called into question here. Okay, so what happens with Darwin in Tierra del Fuego and Marlowe in Africa in these parallel encounters. Okay. And what is the function of Conrad's descriptions of Europe and of Africa in Heart of Darkness? I mean, think about that. Novels don't just have characters in action, they also have setting, don't they? And for some novels and some novelists, setting becomes so important that setting becomes almost a character in its own right. And that's certainly true of Heart of Darkness. where the setting described at the beginning and the end of the work in Europe is described in some detail and is extremely important. And then, of course, Africa is so important in the great middle of the work that Africa virtually becomes the major character in the work. Yeah. Um, do you mind if we bring in a separate copy of Heart of Darkness? I mean, there's there's so much devoted to it, and it's so small in the in the text and the anthology. Oh, that's all right. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, 
you know, one of the things that we did was we brought in Achibi's criticism, didn't we? Let's let's go back just a second. Um, we uh, we brought in Achibi's criticism of Conrad and Heart of Darkness, and you might want to weave that into your discussion because Achibi says. You know, it really, virtually these words, he says, you know, this is a racist book. And he cites quite a number of passages. Now, I agree with the Chibi up to a point, but I also think that it's worthwhile at least considering, at least considering, that there may be a kind of ambivalence a kind of ambivalence on Conrad's part. That's at least a question to consider. Okay, which is not in any way to deny the uh, the racism that, that does exist in the work. Okay, let's move ahead here. 19. Compare at least one poem by Yeats and at least one by Eliot as modernist experiments. Now remember, we talked a good deal about how modernism, as a cultural movement in the arts generally, not just in literature, but in the arts generally, places a very high value on experiment, even sometimes experiment for the sake of experiment. And that experiment can be with both content and with form. Treating certain kinds of themes or situations or people or relationships that generally were not treated in earlier work. An obvious case would be uh, the treatments of, of sex. We talked about some of those cases. You know, sex being treated... I mean, sex has always been in, in our literature in one form or another. But uh, in modern literature, often sex will be treated with a kind of explicitness and in a kind of analytical detail that is not common in earlier literature. Okay, so there's that kind of, of experiment. Though there can be other experiments with, with content as well. Uh, and certainly experiments with form. You look at the wasteland, right? The wasteland is not your father's Oldsmobile, as the saying goes. Uh, the wasteland is not a poem like In Memoriam. The wasteland is a very complex, difficult poem whose form itself is very complex and difficult to follow. And we can also find examples in Yeats. Think of sailing to Byzantium, for example. Okay, 20. Compare the views of educational and career opportunities for women in one work by Ellis and one by Wolf. Now, I shouldn't have to say any further words about that because we have spent a great deal of time this semester talking about that whole issue, what the Victorians called the woman question. And you remember Sarah Pinckney Ellis, a selection of whose work we have in our text, and of course, Virginia Woolf. Okay, I'll go back to that when we're, when we're done. In what specific ways does Wolf and Mrs. Dalloway carry out her critique of the pressures toward conformity in modern society? It's a critique of the pressures toward conformity in modern society. And what does she do in Mrs. Dalloway to carry that out? Okay. Is that clear? Shall I go back briefly to the previous one? Mm 
Okay, this is, it, it's simply to compare the, the views of 20s, compare the views of educational and career opportunities for women in Ellis and, and uh, Wolf. Okay. And 21 is simply, uh, how does Wolf carry out her critique of conformity in modern society? Okay. That's basically it. Okay, what is meant by stream of consciousness is a narrative device and to analyze a passage in Wolf's Mrs. Dalloway. Okay. If you're trying to write these down, I'm going to come back to these after we go off the air for people who are just trying to write them down. And people who are watching this on the air or on tape, you can just freeze this at any point. Okay? I just want to make sure that I'm getting everything in. 23, what is the function of the descriptions of London in Mrs. Dalloway? We have very extensive descriptions of London in Mrs. Dalloway. What are they doing there? How do they function? Okay. And then 24, discuss in detail how Larkin, Hughes, and Haney respond to a continuing sense of a crisis of faith, which is something that we dealt with in great detail in the first half of today's class. And it's not going to be even in all cases. Okay? Some are going to deal with this to a greater extent or a lesser extent than others. Okay, so these are the study questions for the final. Good luck. <laughs>